Good morning. My name is Anita Harriet. I'm president of the fine art group, the Americas. We'll beginning be beginning our presentation in about 4 minutes. Um, when you join, please don't forget to mute yourself. So we don't have any back noise. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box, either in advance or during the presentation. This will be a 30 minute presentation. So quick, but full of information. Thanks so much. We're going to give a few more minutes for those to join who have uh, it on their calendar invite at the exact time. We tend to see a lot of people join up right at um, 12 o'clock PST. So um, let's give it a few more minutes and then we'll begin. We will be recording this as well. Thank you. Good morning, it's 12 o'clock PST, so it's good afternoon. I'm gonna give this one more minute and then we will uh, begin our presentation. Again, we will be recording this presentation as well. Thank you so much. Good morning. We know that many of you join right at the time, so we're giving you one more minute to join and then we will begin. We'll be starting in about 30 seconds. Just to remind everyone to please mute yourself. In addition, if you have any questions in advance, please go down to the chat box and feel free to put those questions in. Um, in addition to that, please don't forget to mute yourself uh, so we don't have any back noise. I see quite a few people are joining right now, so let's give them a chance to hop on. We will go one or two minutes over uh, 1230 PSAT, PST. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anita Harriet, and I am president of the Fine Art Group Americas. And we're so pleased that you can join us today um, for a new series uh, that we will be doing for the entire year. Um, a little bit about the Fine Art Group. Um, we are kind of we are the largest vertically integrated art firm globally, and that means that essentially in house we have appraisals, advisory, agency, uh, finance, and investment all in-house with in-house expertise with about 50 full-time staff. We are a London-based firm and I'm happy to run the Americas for our firm. So today um, we are going to focus on Picasso prints. And this is a one year, this is a 12 month um, series. And each month we're gonna focus on one area, one asset class in the collectibles world. Today, we're going to focus on one of the most popular assets that many, many of our clients own. One of the reasons we decided to start with Picasso prints, because as appraisers, 
as those that assist with acquisition and sale, we see lots and lots and lots of Picasso prints. And I have to say, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. So today, what I'm hoping that you'll be able to do is gather some tools, um, put them in your tool belt so that moving forward, uh, you can understand the quality um, differentiation between different Picasso prints. And with that, um, I'm going to introduce you to Elena Racheva. Elena Racheva has been with us for a very long time, started as an appraiser a um, long time ago, and now she is a director here at the Fine Art Group. She's a specialist in fine art. She's had extensive auction experience. She's worked at Christie's, Bonham's, Sotheby's. Um, she's a modern and impressionist specialist. We're so lucky to have her on our team. Um, and is she's so full of knowledge. So, Elena, let's just start by giving us a sense of how, what was Picasso's relationship with prints? Why did he choose the print medium um, in such an extensive way? Can you, can you kind of just give us a brief introduction before we start breaking down quality? Yes, sure, Anita. And hello, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. Um, absolutely. Picasso is the sort of central figure of 20th century art, and he was so incredibly prolific so incredibly sort of focused on producing and refining his visual aesthetic in any medium possible. So he, as a painter, as a draftsman, as a sculptor, as a printmaker and as a potter. So he really explored every single mode of expression, artistic expression. And um, so his printmaking practice is really runs alongside his you know, at the core of his artistic practice, he started printmaking right at the end of the 19th century when he was a teenager um, with the sort of great etchings. And he he produced prints until his late 80s and 90s. Um, so it, it really is something that happened every single day um, and evolved all the time. And, you know, much like the rest of his output, he's so prolific. He produced over 2000 um, prints in his lifetime. Not surprising, but still worth um, noting, definitely. Excellent. Well, all right, so let's get down to it. Um, let's talk about what are those kind of categories of analysis that one should understand when they're looking at Picasso prints uh, specifically and really prints generally. And how do you kind of create kind of an A quality? What's the difference between an A quality and a C quality uh, print? So can you just briefly go over the summary and then we can get into the details? Yes, definitely. So this is a this is a sort of a list of criteria that we really focus on um, here at the Fine Art Group. And we do it for every single artwork that we look at for our clients. Um, and it, of course, varies um, on the type of work that we're looking at. Um, and for each of those great sort of elements of analysis, um, areas of, of, of analysis, uh, we assess it and we determine whether it's the very best possible um, level or grade uh, one could give it, um, A being the very best, um, B and C and D and so on and so forth, if it's, an, it's, it's, it's poor. And Prince definitely has its own set of criteria because it's so specialized. Um, it's usually on paper, um, so that has its own inherent um, you know, concerns. Um, there is a printing material, um, there is a, a mode of application, there is a process of creating a body of work that's very specific. So you can see it on screen, but, you know, we put condition left, sort of front, left, and like right and center. Um, condition is such a key, key place to start. And we'll dive into each and every one in, well, in more detail, but condition, um, the signature and the addition size coupled with quality and rarity are, I would say, the most important criteria when looking at Picasso prints. And additionally, it varies from decade to decade and types of print, um, how important the size, the date, the subject matter is within that context. Um, finally, provenance is always very key because it helps us really get to grips with authenticity, which is a big, big topic that we will continue to discuss time and time again. Excellent. Thank you so much, Elena. Okay, so let's talk about condition. I mean, how many times have we been asked to appraise prints and the condition has been absolutely atrocious? And would you agree or disagree that condition can kind of determine 
make a work, you know, truly almost unsellable versus, a, you know, one with great quality. Absolutely. And I think that there are two key factors. Condition is always critical whenever we look at any, any work, an oil painting, a bronze, um, a work on paper. Paper is a particularly sort of um, obviously fragile medium uh, that is very sensitive to light, very sensitive to um, pH balance and also humidity. Um, so sadly, you can see here sort of some sad pictures of, of works that for one reason or another have um, have um, obtained some some concerns and, you know, Condition with works on paper um, is always a tricky one. Some some areas are easier to remediate than, remediate than others, um, and that's something to that one needs to look at. So with foxing, this is a top right picture for those of you who are who aren't as familiar. Is the sort of condition that occurs when there is very humid conditions and there isn't enough flow of air. Um, foxing is something that one can treat um, often and successfully uh, with some time and the right paper restorer. Um, things like acidic matting, uh, which is what you can see in the lower right, can be remediated, but not entirely. If a sheet has been glued down um, in some situations, um, it makes it very, very challenging to do any treatment on the work. Um, so that's another area of concern. Um, First and foremost, I would say the most important thing is to really get a very detailed condition report whenever you're reviewing any work on paper, but specifically prints. Um, and not just a condition report um, from what you can see by looking at the work on the wall, but certainly having it unframed and unmatted to make sure it has not been laid down. Um, light staining and fading um, is something that can't really be, uh, you know, fixed once the pigment's gone. Um, you can't really add pigment that you can, you know, that, that can um, really return the work to its original condition. Um, the sheet integrity is important. Um, cutting down a sheet is problematic. Um, true print collectors do like to see the full extent of a sheet when it was printed. Um, and then, it, of, of course, it's it's always hidden behind a mat or with a, within a frame. Tears can be repaired, but they're still there. So you have a very creased and torn um, work in the lower left, which I I just don't think it's you know something that you can repair. Now, why are we focusing so much on this? If this were um, I don't know a Turner watercolor um, that is of Venice, and there's only one like it, and it has a little bit of maybe a little tear here and there. It has a little bit of time fading, very, very normal. There's only one of that particular view. Let's say it's a view of Switzerland that you love. You go hiking there every single year. You need to have it. Um, you're probably going to compete for it and you're probably going to try and get it because there is no substitute for that view. Now with prints, by virtue of their, their multiples, um, there is 99 other examples from this particular set that are out there and many of them will be in much better condition so um as a buyer whenever we're talking to our buyers um we will always focus on them finding one in pristine condition because when you come to sell the next buyer will just keep on walking if they see a matte stain like this if they see some foxing or some creasing so i think when it comes to buying due diligence and asking lots of questions and knowing what to look for is key and working with your advisor um, and care, care, care for your art collection is a whole other topic that it will take so long to go into, but it's one to expand on. Um, and, uh, you know, preventative care is where you start uh, whenever you acquire a piece of art. So, obviously, if you acquire a Picasso print, you don't want to put it in sunlight. You want to make sure it has the correct matting. Um, and you don't want to be, you know, living in Atlanta and in the summer, you know, turning your AC, you know, turning off your AC and then having it extremely humid. Some basic preventive measures, correct? C correct, exactly. And, you know, whenever you acquire an artwork, let's say you, you like something, you've reviewed it, we've, you've looked at all the comparables, you have the appropriate pricing, you have the condition report, great. 
when you get at home, it's important to make sure that the mat is asset free. If it needs to be remated, it needs to be remated to prevent what's happening in the lower right here. Um, uh, UV treat, you know, UV glazing, uh, professional museum quality glazing. If it's not there already, it needs to be applied. It's not difficult to do. Many framers will do it for you. Simple steps like that will help ensure that your work stays as pristine as possible. Thank you. All right. Now, this is where I say we hit most many of the examples. I can think of many calls we have had where they've said, guess what? We have a Picasso. Um, we'd like to get it valued. And then we go a little deeper and we say, well, is it a, an, a, an original or a print? And then they say, oh, it's a print. And then we say, can you please take a photograph? Because I understand that from a print from in terms of the signature, we could be talking about 0 to 100 in terms of value. Correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, what, what happens with many Picasso prints is Picasso will most of the time, much of the time, sign his prints in the plate. That means that when he's designing his composition um, on the copper plate or on the lithographic stone, he is then using the stylus or his finger or his, his you know, um, whatever it is to, to sign his name. Now that signature is multiplied a hundredfold when it's being printed in the, at the printer's workshop. Um, and that doesn't have the artist's direct involvement. Um, exactly. So when you're looking at the top right image um, is a close-up of an etching where just an, along the top, you have the edge of the etching where the copper plate is printed into the, into the sheet. So that's the plate. And then to the right of that, you have the artist signature in pencil, because that's what you really are looking for. The second image is the Picasso signature in the lithographic stone. Um, so that's not a signature that was added 100 times by the artist in pencil, but that was a print. That's a printed signature. And, you know, really looking at it, you know, if you take it out of the glass, behind the glass and um, really use per perhaps a magnifying loop if you're unsure to understand if a signature is printed or not is key. A printed signature, um, it indicates that the addition may not be controlled. This may be a photographic reproduction of a Picasso print and as such, it has very little value. And so a little wild card down here is uh, a, a signature uh, from Picasso's uh, ceramic series, extensive ceramic series that he produced with the Madura pottery uh, down in the south of France. And here, this signature is not by Picasso, but that's okay because it has the Madura stamp. This is the potter stamp. It has the edition number. Um, this is how these ceramics, these very, very desirable and often very precious ceramics, are additions and stamps. So that's a little bit of a sort of a difference. One other thing apart from signature is date and how he writes his date. And it's something that specifically in the 40s and 50s is interesting. Oftentimes um, he will write his date and have a dot at the end of his date. And some of his ceramics or some of his drawings and paintings have the date and the dot, but not his signature. And if you see a date without the dot, I would I would just kind of have a moment because more often than not, he has a little dot. I mean, it's not a sort of hard and fast rule, but it's something to be aware of. So um, to summarize, the more original the work, the more valuable because we like for his hand to touch the work in terms of the, the paper prints, correct? Correct, exactly, absolutely. Okay. So I know you just touched on additions, but um, I think it's very easy to analyze because you've given pricing here. Can you just take us through how important addition size is? It's, it's, it's one of the most important you know, things because you're talking about how many of this, this object are, how many exact copies or how many objects like this are there in the world. And with, a, with an original oil painting, it's pretty straightforward. It's usually just the one. Um, with prints, by virtue of the medium, there are several. Um, this particular one is such a good example because this particular suite that Picasso was involved with um, at the very beginning of his career, um, the work on the left are the imprints that he made 
uh, from the, the, the copper plate, the original copper plate with all the nuance that you might have, all the sort of the lovely washes and the atmospheric areas that you see in the top left setting the scene. Um, there are very few of these available out there. Um, I think that there is one or two that survive and probably about a half a dozen that he actually printed or a dozen. And some of them just haven't made it or others are in public collection. So they're not in the marketplace. So you can see that this work um, sold for just over $3 million um, 10 years ago. And it's so rare, you know, it's it's in someone's collection. It's probably not going to come up for another 30 years or so. Um, now, the exact same composition, exact same size, designed at the same time, but printed with an addition of 250 is on the right. Now, there are differences between the two. The differences are the copper plate that you use for an etching. Um, when you're applying ink and pressing it onto a piece of paper, over time, the copper plate wears out. So some of the detailing actually um, diminishes. Um, so what happened in this case, in the edition on the right, the 250, Picasso's art dealer, Ambrose Bollard, um, realized that 250 examples of this copper etching are going to really wear out the plate. So he actually lined it with steel. He actually layered the copper with steel, which meant that it was a much more durable plate. So it could just you know, keep whacking them out and just producing them and they will be crisp, they will be beautiful. The quality won't vary. But what does that mean? When you're adding steel to that copper plate that's very detailed, some of the detailing is, is, is gone and it can't be replicated and it ensures quality control, so to speak, of the product, which is these 250 examples. But that really nuanced um, color and composition on the left is, is, is just not there. So you can see that in the price, you know, 130,000, which is a substantial amount. It's a, that's, that's appropriate for this particular work of that edition, but it's an order of magnitude difference. Oh, got it. That is that, that explains it so clearly. Um, now, tell us a little bit about kind of portfolios and sets versus individual prints, and specifically as it relates to Picasso. Yeah. So I think that with all artists, there are seminal sets that they produce that they keep part of their career and uh, that are sort of the apex of their output. So with Picasso is the Volar Suite, and this particular work. Um, Usually there is a specialized print and multiple sale that takes place every season. This particular work is so important um, that it's actually offered in an evening sale context, uh, which is key because there's only about 30 spots in every evening sale to offer important artworks. So the Picasso, Picasso's Volart suite is a very key part of his output because in it, in every single piece of the, every single plate, there are these wonderful motifs that he was really obsessed with in the 30s that he returns to time and time again. It's a it's a set to do with sort of his creativity. It's about this uh, artist that is basically Picasso. Um, he's talking about all the things that he's interested in. He has, uh, you know, Marie Therese, um, his partner in the 1930s there in the center. He has the specter of, of war coming into Europe in the 1930s. Um, it's a very complex body of work. Um, there are 300 uh, etchings. So they were produced over the course of uh, seven years. And um, many of these sets have been separated. And some of the plates, like the one in the top left, um, is actually very, very valuable. Some of them are very valuable on their own. So the one on the top left is um, usually between 100 and $200,000 on its own. Um, however, other, other plates aren't as valuable, but together um, they actually are worth more than the sum of it, their parts, so to speak, because many are in institutions and aren't likely to be the accession anytime soon. Many are sort of separated out because who has space to you know, store or exhibit a hundred etchings um, and they have to be cared for appropriately. Um, it's, a, you know, $1 million worth of very, very sort of sensitive material, life sensitive. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to think about that. And, you know, the Vollard suite, one last thing I should say is that Ambras Vollard was really, really important for, for Picasso's development as a printmaker. 
he was the same dealer that dealt with uh, the Saltim Bank um, etching that we just looked at. The, you know, he made the decision to put the, the the steel plate on those copper plates. So he was very very helpful to Picasso. Excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so you, you've already referenced print states, um, but this is a very good example. And can you just define what a state means? Yes, so a state is this really nice evolution that you see in the artist's working process that the artist has decided to sort of set down in stone or in copper or in ink, whatever you want to call it. Um, and you see this with a lot of you know prolific printmakers. You see this with Picasso, you see this with Munk, you see this with Rembrandt. And a state is, you know, thinking about how the artist works to works to create an etching you have this copper plate that um is is um coated with wax and then is is sort of drawn into and then the 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 plate and the wax is plunged into acid so the acid eats away at certain parts of the plate and not others um and it's basically a snapshot of the evolution of a print at different points in time and what the artist did, what Picasso did here, is that he had this wonderful drawing um, of Dora Maar, um, and he drew it, he printed it, then he went back to the to the plate and added to it. Got to a point where he was very happy with that composition and created the next state. Um, and what's interesting is you see this, you know, Picasso's printmaking process was a part and parcel of this creative process in the context of painting. So, so the sort of the painting on the right is in the Tate Modern in London is and is directly linked to this particular series of, of, of states uh, and etchings of the, of the Weeping Woman. So, um, yeah, you can see the more full state, the last state or the final state, as it's called, um, mm -hmm. is usually the most uh, valuable usually yeah and to see it in color is is you know obviously most is very appealing for the buyer would you call this the most commercial example yet the most expensive um in in terms of the the color so when we see color examples of prints you know they're so rare and we have an oil and canvas here but when you do see prints of picassos that are in color would you say those are the most commercial um, I think that they're very commercial. They're extremely popular with collectors. And I think by and large, Picasso buyers really are drawn to color. I mean, Picasso is an amazing colorist anyway. Um, I think that his experimentation with etching and black and white are phenomenal in terms of the technical prowess and the sort of the dates and the subject matter. However, um, his use of color is wonderful. So when you look at the pieces from the 40s and 50s, which we can look at next, Color is such a key component of his practice, definitely, um, definitely. And so, here we are. So, here we are, yes. exactly. Um, so, you know, I think there was a question about lino cuts. Um, so thank you for that. And, you know, with lino cuts, it's, it really is all about color. And what's interesting is that, again, Picasso just couldn't really help himself. This is something that he did everywhere in all parts of his sort of artistic output is that he explored everything that was available to him and wherever he was staying. So when he was living in the, you know, in, in Paris or the outskirts of Paris, he did a lot of work with uh, printmakers who specialized in etching and photography. And um, when he came to sort of stay in the south of France in the 40s during the war, and later on in the 50s and 60s, because he loved it so much in the south of France is amazing. Um, there isn't as much technical equipment down there. There weren't as many established printmaking studios down there as they were in the north. Um, and so he worked with a very um, a particular um, sort of specialist in lino cuts, the print printing technique that was a, a really nice introduction to the medium for him. And he sought out the very best specialist in that area and this sort of this body of work um, from um, the 1960s usually showing his line of his wife Jacqueline his partner Jacqueline are extremely popular and they're just wonderful and I, I think his approach to to lino cuts and the way he actually experimented with the media he learned what he could from the from the lino cut you know specialist and then he added to it so he had a sort of interesting technique of reducing the lino cuts and not using different parts of linoleum to make up the different colors, but actually managing to 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 um, um, 
work with the linoleum and use use it to print all of the different colors with the one piece of linoleum. Um, and that's a, a technique that you see being used really well here. And you can see, you know, it's an edition of 50, so a slightly smaller edition, really lovely size. Um, it's very, very, it's a very, very popular body of work and it's wonderful. So Elena, if you're based on your analysis at this point, if you were a collector and you were starting a collection of Picasso prints and you wanted to acquire one that held its value and, and potentially went up over time, um, paying the right price, of course, where would you be drawn to in terms of you, you giving advice to a client? I think that the really nice starting point are his works from the 60s uh, because there, uh, there are many different techniques that he has from this in the 60s he has in his toolkit you know so to speak so his etching technique is is really finely developed and finely tuned but he is doing a, a wonderful what lots of wonderful lithography and lino cuts so that you have the full range of um of of techniques to choose from and i think as you said earlier color is such a such a great draw for collectors across the board and when you're buying you're buying because you love the work and you want to live with it but the the sort of the, the your advisor needs to think about what the wider market is for that work so first and for, foremost buy what you absolutely love and want to look at but also buying something that everyone else wants to buy after you 50 years time is also important and these are just wonderful and so easy to live with now many of our clients are confused by the ceramics and you already mentioned the ceramics earlier um the ceramics are really a form of print can you just again just very quickly summarize to what extent they're, they are a print and um, a little bit about the market. Yes, um, they are a multiple um, and they're created from the artist's design that he worked on very specifically and purposefully in close association with the pottery. Um, the Picasso, um, Picasso's work in ceramics really came about from the mid 40s and early 50s uh, when he visited this great ceramic pottery studio, Madura, um, led by a husband and wife team, um, the Rami family. And he was so interested by this um, art form that was very informed by the Mediterranean context of living on the sea and just being influenced by Southern French, sort of Northern Spanish um, techniques, Northern African techniques and Southern Spanish techniques in painting and pottery. Um, he did a lot of work in, Madura, in the Madura pottery. He had lived in the South of France in the villa nearby and he would come in every single day and throw some pots, work with the, with, um, the, you know, the material and would make his own shapes. And he would he would work with um, the artisans there to fire them appropriately because that's also very very tricky. Um, so what he would do is he created unique ceramics which are phenomenal and they're an entirely different body of work. But he would make very specific a number of very specific forms and uh, compositions that the Madura pottery then produced with the help of very hand handful of hand picked pottery sort of specialists that would produce these for him and you saw they stamped they're actually inscribed and numbered and they have a very detailed catalog the rami catalog that you have to consult every time you look at these um condition also very important for for ceramics um and it's interesting because you end up doing a lot of analysis that's related to porcelain condition reporting um you know you have to really understand with ceramics and additions in ceramics how the pot is fired you have to look for for glazing imperfections and kiln marks you know the little you know the little pots when they're fired in the kiln they sit on a little you know, tripod and then that's taken away after the piece of you know pottery is, is is made so you have to check how nicely it's come away from underneath so there's sort of fine detail there they're so livable i mean they're they, they're so easy to live with they're wonderful um, and I, I also urge new collectors to look at these as well because there's wonderful plates. These pots are one, they're, they're great because you can have them in the round and enjoy them in the round as well. 
and there is such a wide variety of subject and color palettes to choose from. Thank you. Um, so, uh, any other questions, um, Elizabeth would let us know if we have any other specific questions that we have not addressed. Um, but what I would say is that the key thing is to make sure that if you are acquiring a Picasso print, that you look at those categories of analysis, you consult with your advisor, you work with a prominent dealer um, or an auction house whose reputation um, is very important. Uh, to make sure you're acquiring the right work at the right price. Is there anything I'm missing, Elena? No, no, you covered it. You did. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, every month we will focus on another interesting asset within the collectible categories. Um, and we're going to be covering everything from Tiffany lamps to um, baseball trading cards. So, um, you know, stay tuned and we'll send you our invite to the next uh, presentation. And again, thank you, Elena, for all of your knowledge.